week after week, as I take this platform, I know what I want to say. It is merely finding out how to say it, so that it is intelligible. For you are dealing with a mystery. It's not something you can spell out and say, now this is it. It's a peculiar, the most fantastic mystery in the world. To me, to experience scripture, to experience God's plan of salvation, is my interpretation of the whole purpose of life. That is what I firmly believe. I firmly believe that the roots of our being are rooted in God. And God unfolds himself creatively in us. When I make that statement, I put myself on the side of that which has been transformed, say a man. For metamorphosis is the theme of the Bible. That is the complete transformation of man into God. When I make a statement, as I've just made it, it seems that this is man, you and I the man, being transformed by a being other than ourselves. And I don't mean that at all. But man is so conditioned to believe he's a little worm that you approach him that angle. You and I are the God transforming man into our image, into our likeness. But then if I said that to a large crowd, the curtain would come down and they wouldn't hear one word I had to say beyond that. But you and I took the plunge. We were the sons of God, together making God. For the word God is the plural word. The word is Elohim. In the beginning God, that word is Elohim, is plural. And God said, let us make man in our image. The same word is Elohim. It's a compound unity. One made up of others. We are told in Deuteronomy that he has set bounds to the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. No child can be born unless God occupies that little temple. These are the gods that came down. You and I are the gods that we are transforming these identities, these men and women with which we are identified into our likeness. Rather than being transformed by something other than ourselves. We are the gods that came down. And when we awake, we are the gods spoken of in the very beginning. In the beginning, God, Elohim, plural, the gods, created the heavens and the earth, like creating a theater for the display of its might and its creative powers. And then the God said, let us make man in our image. So we came down and clothed our worlds in these garments. We are pretending we completely abandon our worlds to these garments. The secret is self-abandonment. Never would you have made anything had you not loved it. Never we so loved it. And so having loved it, we commit ourselves to the object of our love and actually become it. Self-commission is the secret. Now when we are told, be imitators of God as beloved children. In this world, we have forgotten who we are. Now comes the revelation, be imitators of God as beloved children. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Now imitate that. But on this level, I feel myself never 
But I know from experience, I am the one that became Neville. To transform this identity into my own being. The being that was, that has no beginning. And there was a plan that I set forth within myself when I buried myself in this being called Neville. This is true of everyone in the world. Now listen to this carefully. It's the first chapter of Ephesians. I'm just quoting four verses. You'll find them within the first ten verses. So I've omitted just a few because they're not necessary for what I want to get over. God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He destined us in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. He destined us in love through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. You listen to it carefully, go home and you read it. The first chapter within the first, I think it's the fourth, fifth, ninth and tenth verses of first, the only one book called Ephesians. So the first chapter, you'll read it in the fourth, fifth, ninth and tenth verses. God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So we see that the salvation of man is not an afterthought of the creator. It is prior to this historical process. Long before this was animated and became history, human history, this decision was made. So our fitness is the consequence, not the condition of his choice. So here as Neville, I, the true being, chose Neville. I'm going to play Neville. You chose the being that you've chosen. And we came down into this and animated it, this historical process. We are the gods who made the decision. We are identifying ourselves with these garments. We are transforming these into ourselves. Now that is something that the world shuns against. They abhor it because they do not realize that man, the man, can do nothing to save himself. There's not a thing that man, as man, can do. It is the God who is buried within man who does it? As we are told in the letter to the Philippians, he, meaning God, who started the good work in you, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The day of Jesus Christ is the unveiling of this plan in you. For Jesus Christ is in you. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Were he not in you, then you would be a dead, dead body forever and forever. But the gods came down, and it takes all the gods, called the sons of God, to form God. The one became fragmented into the many. One fell, containing all. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Do you get it? Before there was a world, we were, we are the gods. We are in the one being that is known in scripture as God. And we came down for one purpose, to expand our own creativity. And we do it by actually burying ourselves in humanity. Now, crucifixion is either a demonstration of the most horrible failure in the world or the greatest success 
in the world. It has been proven that the seed that fell, which is called the Word of God, and the Word of God is God, and that is God himself. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was the seed that fell into humanity. That's called the crucifixion. Well, it rose, and it continues to rise, because all the suns will rise. None will fail. If one fell, we'd have to leave everyone behind and go in search of the one. Because the one that is missing completes the one. The one body, the one spirit, the one Lord, the one God and Father of all. So night after night as I take the platform, I know exactly what I want to say. And my problem is how to say it. So as to be intelligent. To be understood by those who hear me. For man has been conditioned to believe that he's a silly little thing in the world who has sinned. And having sinned, now he must make all kinds of penance to redeem himself. Man cannot redeem himself. It is God who comes down. And by his crucifixion, which is the burial in God, God now demonstrates his creative power that he can die and rise again. So he dies in man. I am crucified with Christ, said Paul. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by reason of the faith that I have in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So that Son of God is in you. You say, I am, that's he. That's the Son of God. But you so love the object to whom you gave yourself that you abandoned yourself completely and emptied yourself of your divinity and just buried yourself in the object of your love. And you're going to transform it into yourself, who is God. Then when you transform it you are the same God, only you have expanded beyond that moment in eternity when you ventured into this experiment, becoming your own creation. So be imitators in the world of Caesar, be imitators of God as beloved children. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself to us, now imitate that, so are you in love with me? Nothing wrong with it. Are you in love with fame? There's nothing wrong with it. Are you in love with physical health? Nothing wrong with it. But be in love with it. If you are in love with it, you must do the same thing that God did in the beginning, and you are that God of whom I speak, who so loved the object that is you when you see it reflected, that he abandoned himself, no restraint, a complete abandonment of self to the object of his love. For if there is no object of the love, no beloved, what is love? There must be a beloved to demonstrate love. And so you have an object, your emanation, which is nothing more than your wife. Not your physical wife, the body is your emanation, that's your wife. Till the sleep of death is over. And you so loved it, you're going to transform it into the most beautiful, perfect thing in the world which is just like you, who is perfect. So he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. That's what we are told. So he chose me, who he, what I am he. But to become me, he has to forget that I am he. And he thinks he is never. He has to. He chose me in him before the foundation of the world. But now, I am the one who forgot and became never. When I awake, I know I was before the foundation of the world. But now I bring never with me. And now I have one more aspect of my protean being. I have another being. 
I have redeemed. I fell in love with it and brought it back. And now I am the protein being, so that I can see others and let the others see me as never. So they see me as never. But do they really see me? They see me as never. When they see me clothed in power, clothed in wisdom, or maybe clothed in love. And they'll see me because I so loved that. I gave myself to it and raised it to the level of my own being prior to coming down into it and burying myself within it. So when I try night after night to tell it, I hesitate because I wonder is this as clear as I can make it? I know what I want to say, but how to say it so that it is understood, that it is intelligible? Because you've got to go through all the preconceived misconceptions that man has concerning Scripture. And so I say to experience Scripture, to experience God's plan of salvation, is really the whole purpose of life. But while we are here, we can be anything we want to be. And the being within us, with our true being, allows it. And will go the part with us and play everything. But I am speaking to the God in you. The God in Scripture, whose name is Elohim, or Jehovah, or the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the same being who is buried in you. He's actually buried in you. And that he will rise. Now teach me, O Lord, teach me, O Holy Spirit, the testimony of Jesus, that I may actually comprehend wondrous things out of the divine law. Teach me, O Holy Spirit, for tell me the story of the God who became man, that man may become God. And then we are told the story in a very simple way. For truth embodied in the tale shall enter in at lowly doors. So you tell it in the simplest tale imaginable, right in the beginning, you tell the story. Truth embodied in the tale shall enter in at lowly doors. So mother would take me on her knee and tell me the story of Jesus. He had no father, but he did one thing, claim he was the father. Well, she didn't understand that, and neither did I. He had no father. But he claimed he was the father. I and my father are one. Then she told me that he had a miraculous birth. It was not like any birth in the world. Something different. And then she told me that he said that unless we are born in a similar manner, for he said, I am from above, that he was born from above, and unless you are born from above, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Then he also said that the most perfect man born of woman was John the Baptist. And yet the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. Therefore John the Baptist cannot be in the kingdom of heaven if the least is greater than he. No matter how little it becomes, the least is greater, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Mother did not understand that, any more than I did when she told me. Then she told me that David in the spirit called him my Lord. She didn't understand that, and neither did I. And then she told me that he identified himself as the Son of Man and then likened the Son of Man to a fiery serpent. And that unless the Son of Man is lifted up in the same manner in which the fiery serpent was lifted up, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Then she told me that when he was baptized, a dove descended upon him and remained upon him. And the outer man knew that outer man was called John. And he knew because it was revealed to him the one on whom the dove descended and remained was the Son of God. The one that came down from heaven. For no man can ascend into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man. But all this was a mystery. 
but a lovely story that excited the child mind. And so you carried it with you. This is something that is all within you. And then comes this shocking suddenness. When you least expected it, it all happened in you. Now I go back to Ephesians. He set it forth as a plan in Christ for the fullness of time. He set it forth in Christ. In Christ, yes, and Christ is in you. God himself descended into man and he set forth his plan of redemption in Christ. So in Christ, it is in man, it has now to unfold in man, so it unfolded in me. And I realize that I am he who came down. For no man can go up unless he first came down. But having gone up in the fiery serpent manner, then I must have been the one who descended. But when I went up, I went up without the loss of the identity of Neville. So I came down and redeemed a being called Neville. You come down and so identify yourself with the being that you believe yourself to be. That when you go up you take that which you have redeemed with you. You present it to your brothers for the all waiting for the presentation of your act of faith. For faith is complete self-commission. I cannot commit myself to that which I do not love. So God is love. So I loved it and then agreed with all of us to commit myself to that. And then I committed myself to it and lost all consciousness of the being that I really am in my self-commission to the object of my love. And then I went through hell, as we all do. But as Paul said, I consider the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. What glory? The only glory is the glory of God. So the cry of one who has accomplished the job is this in the 17th of John. I have accomplished the work thou gavest me to do. Now glorify thou myself, glorify thou me with thine own self. Glorify me with your own self. Return unto me the glory that was mine, the glory that I had with thee before that the world was. So bring it in now, the glory that I gave up in my self-commission to the object of my love. Now let it return. So I brought back individualized a garment I can wear in eternity. It was dead and I like the seed that fell into the ground and died revealing the great secret, the mystery of life through death. So I died. I died when I became this and then suffered all the hell of the world and then the pattern which I contain unfolded within me. So he's made manifest unto me the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. So he set it forth in Christ as the plan. Well that plan is Jesus Christ buried in man. It's a pattern. So the pattern man how to tell the world that Jesus Christ is the pattern of salvation buried in man. When man has been taught to believe that Jesus Christ is a little man who walked 2,000 years ago and then disappeared having told a story to return again into this world physically that physical eyes would seem as coming from without. That's what the world has been told. But that is the truth embodied in a tale that it may enter in at lowly doors for if you told it as I've told you tonight the world couldn't take it. They will be shocked beyond measure to hear what you have heard tonight so they would not accept it. 
they believe in some little external savior that came 2,000 years ago and who promised to return and the great teachers of today, great in the sense of numbers but not in understanding, are looking for him to come from without. He can't come from without because he's buried within us. He can only come when he awakens within us. And that pattern is the pattern in a seed. But this is God's seed, the word of God, buried in man. It unfolds within man. When it unfolds within man, everything said of Jesus Christ, the individual in whom it unfolds, experiences it in the first person singular, present tense experience. Then he knows who God is. He always was God who emptied himself and took upon himself the form of man. And being found in the form of man, he became obedient unto death, even death upon the cross of man. And was made in that state a slave. But in the end, he fulfills his purpose. And then he is given a name that is above all names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of all. Well, who is that Jesus? He's in you. So when you actually fulfill and accomplish the job that you took upon yourself, you bear the name of Jesus. There is only one Lord. We all return, scattered as we are, we return as the one Lord, the one God, the one Father of all. One body, one spirit, not many. And yet without loss of identity. <clears throat> if I could take you with me into the actual experience. Coming through two mornings ago. Here I am on the surface of my being. I know exactly what I'm doing. And I'm spirit. And here is this whole vast world. And the world is dead, just dead. But I cannot move it unless I come down into it. I come down into it, but now with the memory of having been born from above, having come down into it, I can change it. Prior to being born from above, you lose all consciousness of the being that you are that came from above. And you come back night after night into the garment and you're simply one more of the crowd, lost. But now, after the birth from above, after you begin to grow in stature, in the favor of the gods who preceded you in the same similar birth, memory now remains. So you come back in the morning from your union with the others. And you come back and you see it for what it is. It's all dead. But now, you do not lose the consciousness as you did prior to the birth from above. So you come down, you can change it, if you so desire. But why change it? Listen to these words that came from Blake, when Blake departed this world. But Blake was born from above long before he departed this world. So, in a book called Looking at Mom Paintings, there's a chapter on Max Beckman, considered a great modern artist of modern paintings. He said he met Blake in this super terrestrial world. And there was this giant of a man, like a supernatural being, and he waved greetings to him. And he said to me, have confidence in objects. Do not let yourself be intimidated by the horror of the world. Everything is ordered and correct and must fulfill its destiny in order to attain perfection. Follow this path and you will attain from your own ego and have a deeper perception of the eternal beauties of creation you will also attain an ever-increasing release from all that which now seems to you so sad and terrible. The whole thing is ordered. The whole thing leads towards the perfection 
that you determined to bring about when you emptied yourself as God and actually became the being that you are today. And you will awake from it all and you will return to the glory that was yours before that the world was. Only magnify it beyond what it was by reason of your venture into this world of death. This was the limit of contraction, the limit of opacity, and you took it upon yourself. Now, there is no limit to the expansion, to the translucence that you bring back. So we all are returning to the being that we were before that the world was. So when we read, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. We were the gods. We were the sons of God that collectively make God. So that wonderful confession of the Hebrew faith is the greatest confession in the world. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Over which is simply, I am. Friendly, the Lord, Yehoranoi, the Lord. And here, our God, as plural, Elohim, we are the God. But together, we are Adonai, one God. So it takes the one made up of many to form the one God that is the confession, the Shema of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Never forget it. No little man, little picture, do you stand before and worship. All this is dead. But men make idols of, of men. So he has money, or oh, he's a tyrant. Like a Lenin, so they make a little icon of Lenin, and thousands every day walk past this stupid little thing that was kept on display. And I read Buckley's statement today, there was great line, Leningrad. It used to be St. Petersburg. It was Peter's Square, the Saint Square. Now it is Leningrad. And here's this little mummified thing. And a friend of his walking by, the little mummified thing, had his hand in his pocket. And the God, in the most impressive manner, to take your hand out of your pocket. Passing through holy ground, here is the, the word made flourish, and he dwelt among us. And the way he treated it was perfectly marvelous, the way he treated this horrible, stupid concept of worshipping this little thing. So they had to pick it up a few years ago and rebuild it because... Time takes his troll and was disintegrating it. And this is their little icon that they worship. I tell you, the only God in the world is within you. There is no other God. One day you will know it. One day he will unfold in you. Read the story carefully. For when he unfolds within you everything said of him in Scripture, you are going to experience in the first person singular present tense experience and his only son which is only the personification of all the experiences that you have ever had as man so take all the experiences of man and all that man could ever experience and fuse it into a single whole and personify that whole and it comes out as David the David of scripture the great psalmist that's David and he stands before you and he calls you my Lord. He calls you my Father. That is the only Son of God, which is a personification of the sum total of all the experiences of humanity. So when you, playing the part you're playing, have gone through all the gamut that man is capable of experiencing, in the end, you break. And then the sum total of the experiences is fused and personified and stands before you and, and, and a glorious beautiful lad David and he calls you my father my lord and the drama is over as far as you are concerned then you join the brothers that you knew before the world was 
and you contemplate the world of death, you become one of those who in great eternity contemplate death. And you too will say, what seems to be is to those to whom it seems to be, and is productive of the most dreadful consequences to those to whom it seems to be, even of torments, despair, and eternal dread. But divine mercy steps beyond and redeems you in the one body, the Lord Jesus, who is Jehovah. It's only one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God, and Father of all. So all are redeemed eventually. But the man, as a man, can't redeem himself. It's God in man that is doing the work. He who began the good work in you will bring it to completion at the unveiling angel of God as you. So my problem night after night is to find words to tell it. I know what I want to say. The problem is how to say it. How to say it that it is understood, that it is intelligible. Because you must always bear in mind you are facing an audience that may not be prepared for the shock. For it is a shock to the human mind to tell them who they are. They rather depend on something external to themselves and pray to it. So they go to church and light a candle. And they bow before some little man-made cross or man-made star. And they do all these things on the outside. And no one has confidence in himself. And the self of man is God. That wonderful human imagination of yours, that is the eternal God. So tonight I said, our roots are in God. And God himself unfolds himself within us. I could have said, our roots are in divine imagining. And divine imagining unfolds itself within us. But it doesn't matter. I personally like the word God. <coughs> but I do not put him on the outside or as something to worship. The world will accept that better if I said God than if I said divine imaginary. So I did not say it in the beginning of the lecture. I now present it to you. But when you imagine that God creating and all things are possible to God. So begin to imagine that's God. God in action. But believe in the reality of the imaginal act. So you imagine yourself to be what reason denies and your senses deny. But imagine it. God so had to completely abandon himself to the form of man. To believe himself man. Do you know what that is? The being that you really are? For I tell you, when you come back after the birth from above and find yourself spirit, I mean spirit, but more real than anything in the whole various world, put all put together. But you're a spirit, and you're more real than any object in space or all the objects in space. But to come down prior to the birth is to forgive yourself as spirit. And God is spirit. And you do it after this birth without loss of identity. That's the lovely part about it. When you come back into the world, and make the garment that is asleep on the bed quite normally, naturally. Bathe it and shave it and feed it and do all the normal things with it. But you know it to be a garment. And you know you've extracted from it a certain identity, which identity you take back as spirit. For the body is going to be put into the furnace and be discarded. That will be simply reduced to the ash that it is. But you have extracted from it a certain identity and you take that into the brotherhood your accomplishment you came down and died as a man and now you go back bringing back the identity of the man that you wore through the ages and you take it back and you're all greeted in joy because you accomplished that which you intended 
So the will of God will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his mind. In the latter days, you understand perfectly. Only in the latter days. So the sufferings of the present age cannot be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For those whom he foreknew, and he foreknew all of his sons, we are the sons. Regardless of your sex, we are the sons. For in the resurrection we are above the organization of sex. We are neither male nor female. We are God. And those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So no matter what you have done as man, you will receive justification. In other words, divine acquittal, complete acquittal, no matter what you've done. If you played the part of a Hitler or a Stalin or any other monster, you will be acquitted. On this level, you want them all to suffer. But your brothers, knowing the part you play, they don't want you to suffer. They want you to awaken from the dream of being a Hitler, the dream of being a Stalin, or any other horrible character in the world. And so when you come before him, having been called, that is justification. And justification in Scripture is nothing more than divine acquittal. And after justification comes glorification, which is God's gift of himself to you. You are then God the Father. And all the songs together form God the Father. Now let us go into the silence. Tonight's subject is signs and wonders. We are told in scripture that the Lord brought his people out of Egypt with signs and wonders. Haven't started really. Coming. <clears throat> In Scripture, a sign is a demonstration of God's favor. As we are told in the 86th Psalm, and David is speaking, show me a sign of thy favor. He wants a sign, a certain sign, a definite sign, by which he leads his people out of Egypt. The journey is from darkness to light, from bondage to freedom, from death to life. So while we are here in the world, a world of death, a world of bondage, a world of darkness, there are certain signs and we ask for the sign of your favor to start the journey out of this world of bondage into freedom, out of death into life. In the 78th Psalm, one whose name is Asa, the way means to gather together like a historian. Twelve are attributed to this one called Asa. He is the gatherer. He is the historian. And he begins the story. He said, Give me your ears. He's asking for attention for those that he will address. And then he said, I will open my mouth to you in a parable and utter dark sayings from of old. And then he recites the Exodus, that is, he recites the signs 
in the book of Exodus. All the signs and the, and the miracles of God. But he begins by telling us it is a parable. Well, a parable is a story told as if it were true. Leaving the one who hears it to discover its fictitious nature, its character, and extract its true meaning, just what it is trying to tell man. It's difficult to tell these stories on this level, so they're told in the form of, well, signs and wonders. In the very end of the song, he said, and the Lord awoke as like a man out of strong, strong drink. He was better in wine, as it were. And then he called David. The Lord awoke as from a dream, a deep, deep sleep imposed as though he had excessive wine. And then he called David. And then he goes on to show the story of David. But first of all, we must remember it is a parable. Paul tells us in his letter to the Galatians, which is considered the first letter or the first book of the New Testament. It's not chronologically so today, but it is chronological. As far as it's dating though, it's the first portion of the New Testament. And he tells us the story of Abraham is an allegory. If the story of Abraham is an allegory, well then the story of Jesus is an allegory. For the New Testament begins on these words. Here is the book. Here is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then it goes through the genealogy. Well, if the story of Abraham is an allegory, then the story of Jesus is an allegory. Yet behind the allegory, behind the parable, there is a tremendous truth. See, there are two histories in the world. History is simply what occurs. What actually occurs is history. But what man likes to remember is legend. And there is a legend. Scripture is the legend. That too is history, but it's divine history. It's the history of salvation. That will be forever and forever. Human history will pass away and leave not a trace behind it. I don't care how we try to map our faces on the mountainside and build monuments to ourselves and make all kinds of statues. They will all crumble and pass away. Everything that man has ever accomplished in this world will all vanish. But divine history is forever. It's like a standing order. Something to be done absolutely and continuously. So that not one being in this world experiences the signs and the wonders. Everyone will experience the signs and the wonders. And when he experiences these signs and wonders, then he reinterprets scripture in the light of his own experience of scripture in the signs and wonders. He realizes what the birth really means. When we are told, as Simon tells us, the child, this little child called the Christ child, is a sign for the fall and rising of many in Israel. It's a sign. The whole story of Jesus, if you understand it, is a sign. Everything about it, all the things about him, are all signs. And the story will unfold itself in you, individually. God's mightiest act, in the light of which all the other signs and wonders of Jesus' career are understood, is the resurrection. That begins the signs and wonders. 
The individual's resurrection is simply equivalent to the coming of Christ. When you are raised, and you will be, it is simply equal to the coming of Christ. And it doesn't come from without, it comes from within. Today, here we are, all of these great evangelists, highly publicized, speaking to millions of people, and they're waiting for him to come from without. Hopefully they'll be here to greet him. They'll wait in vain. He cannot come from without, because he's already within us. The crucifixion is over, and it did not take place 2,000 years ago. It took place in the beginning of time. That's when God was buried in man, for a purpose. Not because of anything that was wrong, just for a purpose. He took the limit of contraction with man, that he may expand. By coming down to the very limit of contraction, then God could expand. For expansion is forever. Forever and forever. There can be no limit to the expansion of God. In order to expand, he first contracts. And man is the contraction that he took upon himself. And this is the only cross in the world that is ever bore. He was never crucified on a wooden cross. I presume there's some nut in the world to command and actually crucified him on the and cross, no question about it. That some distorted mind did it as we hang people and do these things to each other. But the actual cross spoken of in scripture is the human body. That is the cross on which God is crucified. And as we are told, if we have been crucified with him, in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. For we found union with him in a crucifixion like this. We are all crucified. I am. You are. Therefore, when we are individually raised from the dead, we shall find union with him in a resurrection like this. And everyone is going to be raised but raised out of this body, not out of some little tomb in the cemetery. It doesn't matter where you got this little garment, whether it's pulverized by a bomb, whether it's cremated, as so many of us today require, or whether it can be disintegrated in the land. It doesn't really matter. It's not there that you are. This is the tomb of God. This is the sepulchre of God. And here, and only here, we rise, and rise from within. And these are the signs and the wonders. It begins with the resurrection. And the very night of the resurrection, within a matter of moments following the resurrection, is the birth from above. Symbolized in the imagery of scripture, a little child wrapped in swaddling clothes which Simeon said, it is a sign given to us for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. In other words, here is the sign. You can either accept it or reject it. You accept it as the sign, as Matthew tells us, of Emmanuel, God is with us. For this is the name given to the child. God is with us. When you see the child, and for that moment, it is God that is born. But who is born? You are born. You are the one who actually begins to awake. You awake within your own skull. And when you are completely awake, as you have never been awake before, you find yourself completely entombed within your skull. That's the sepulchre. And you are all alone, and no one helps you get out. But you have an innate wisdom. You know exactly what to do. And you do it. You push the base of your skull and something gives. It actually gives. And as it gives, it opens. a very small opening. And you push your head 
from within your skull, you push it out of your own skull. Therefore, you are not the skull. This thing you think to be yourself now is only a gum that you're wearing. Because you, the real you, in an entirely different body, you come out. And this is not your body, this is only a garment that you are wearing. As much as this is the garment that the body wears, flesh and blood is the garment that I wear. And you come out from the base of your skull and you squeeze yourself out just like a little child being born from the womb of a woman. Only this time it's from the skull, not from the womb. And when you come out, the imagery of scripture, all the signs and wonders surround you. Here are the witnesses to the event. And they come suddenly, unexpectedly. Suddenly they appear, and there they are. Three, in my case, as scripture descri describes them, there were three. In my case, there were three. They were my brothers, my older brothers. And there were three of them. And the wind, the unearthly wind, is present. You can't quite describe it, but wind and spirit are the same in Hebrew and in Greek. So the wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it. But you cannot tell whence it comes or whither it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. And here is this unearthly wind. And you are disturbed because it's just like a storm, a terrific storm. And as you look, thinking it may come from there. Then one of these on the bed, where the body lay. For here you came out of the body, and the body's on the bed. It's ghastly pale. And one gets up to investigate the source of the wind. And as he goes one or two feet, he is attracted by something on the floor. And he lifts what is on the floor, and it's an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. And he announces what the infant is, and he calls you by your earthly name. In my case, it's Neville. He said, it's Neville's baby. The other two, they said in the most incredible voice, how can Neville have a baby? He doesn't argue the point, he presents the evidence. And here he places on the bed an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. And then I took the infant in my hands, and looking into his face, I said, how is my sweetheart? A heavenly smile broke upon its face, and the name was caught up out of my hands, and the whole vision came to an end. That's the first night, but it begins with the resurrection. This is not a story of this world at all. So when we are told the story, as Tennyson said, truth embodied in a tale, shall enter in at lowly doors. We are incapable on this level of grasping this profound truth. So it is told to us in the form of a tale that you would tell to a child. And so my mother told me the tale. Then I went to school and they repeated the tale. And then I went through life and they repeated the same tale. And then when I'm a man, a completely mature man, then it happened in me. And then I had to reinterpret scripture in the light of my own experience of scripture. Now I know it is not historically true. As we understand history, if by history means secular history, it is not historically true secularly. Yet it is divine history. Something that is taking place forever and forever. And at the appropriate time, the individual is drawn into that thing that is always taking place. And then he who is buried in the individual awakes, and he is God. It's the story of the birth of God, who deliberately came down and assumed the limitations of the thing called man. But he is not man, he is God. And you are God. Every child born of woman is God. The very moment that he breathed, that was God. That was the breath of God. But he must go through the horrors of the world. Why? Time will prove why. 
we must suffer. Why we must actually go through all the experiences and the pain of this world. But when you think of the end the result, then I presume it will all vanish as though it never will. When you think what actually takes place as a result of our sufferings when we became man. So the signs and the wonders by which God led his people out of Egypt. Now Egypt is on the north coast of Africa. The world is Egypt. America is Egypt. Russia is Egypt. Everything in the world, this earthly state is Egypt. It's a world of darkness a school of educated darkness. And we are led out of this school of educated darkness into light. We are led out of bondage into freedom. We are led from death, for this is death, everything here decays. It appears no matter how glorious it is, it appears it's so lovely, it's altogether wonderful. And then it waxes, it wanes, and it vanishes. Everything dies. I don't care what it is, it all dies, everything. We are told today by our scientists that the very stars are slowly dying. Trillions and trillions of light years, but they die. That everything dies. So here we are in a world of death, and we are being led out of death into eternal life. And you are that eternal one, and you cannot die. No one in this world can really die. You die, yes, burn it up, and you see it turn to ash. But the being who occupied it is instantly restored to life in a world terrestrial just like this. That's not resurrection. That is restoration. Resurrection is something entirely different. That comes at the end of the journey. When man has gone through the entire gamut of human experiences, then at that moment in time, his father within him, which is himself, his true identity, is God the Father, he awakens him. And as he awakens, he comes out. And then the imagery of scripture, he experiences, but he is cast in the central role. He is an actor, the star actor in the role. He is not an observer. He observes what happens, but he is the actor, the central actor in the part. And if this is a story of Jesus Christ as told in Scripture, and you experience that, well then you are Jesus Christ. And Jesus is only another name for Jehovah. Same root, yod heh vav begins Jehovah, it begins Jesus, which in Hebrew is Joshua. So it is simply the same being, and you are that being. It's the story of you. And I wouldn't care if the whole vast world rose in opposition to what I've just told you. It would make no difference to me whatsoever, for I couldn't deny it. I could no more deny what I've experienced than I could the simple evidence of my senses. I am touching this piece of wood here. And I can't deny that I am touching this little lectern. Well, I could no more deny this than I could deny what I've told you, for I've experienced it. I am not speculating. I am not theorizing. The story of Jesus unfolds itself within the individual. And when it does, he has escaped the world of death. So David could say, what can flesh do to me? Thou hast redeemed me. And in the end, you are completely redeemed. And the being, the being that stands before you to prove who you are, is David. You would not let me rest in hell, said he. Thou hast redeemed me. And David is simply the personification of humanity. Having played all the thoughts that man could ever conceive, good, bad, and indifferent, yes, the thief and the judge, the one who is beheaded and the one who behaves, the king and the serf, the giant and the dwarf, 
I've played them all. And having played them all, there's nothing else to play. And so you come to the end of the journey. When you come to the end of the journey and you've borne your part of the allotted time, well then, there's not a thing to do but awake. And in that moment you awake. And you remain long enough to tell it to your brothers. For every one of the world is your brother. And everyone in the world not only is your brother, but he is your very self. You will reign in the end as one man, Jesus Christ. Only one without loss of identity. Everyone will be the Lord Jesus Christ. And there will be no loss of identity. So I don't care what you have done, what you are doing, what you plan to do, all your hopes, in the end you are the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is nothing but the Lord Jesus, who is one with Jehovah. He is God the Father. And you eventually will discover yourself to be God the Father. And these are the signs and wonders, has nothing to do with history. But if you look at it, it's a tradition of doubtful certainty. You read the 78th Psalm, which is only magnifying the signs and wonders of the book of Exodus. I will utter dark sayings from of old, sayings that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. And now I will not hide them from their children, but I will tell them to the coming generation these things that God has wrought. And then he itemized all these fantastic signs and wonders. Read the signs and they all unfold within you. But when they unfold in you, they are so unlike what they appear to be when you put them down in the written law. That wonder child spoken of in Isaiah. And you see it in Isaiah. And the child is not of any virgin, as the churches teach. Just a wonder child is born, and his name is Emmanuel. God is with us. And unto us, we are told in the ninth chapter of Isaiah, a child is born, and a son is given. And then we name the four names or titles of that one. One of them is Father, Everlasting Father. And here is this something unfolding in you. Well, how am I a father? I am a father. I have a son, 47 years old. And I have a daughter, 29 years old. But that's not the fatherhood of which the Bible speaks. It speaks only of the one child. For well, here we are told in Genesis that Abraham had a son and he named him Ishmael. Twelve years later, he had another by promise and it was named Isaac, meaning he left. Yet in the story, and the Lord speaks and tells him he only has one son and that son is Isaac. Now, the Lord is not a liar. And yet the Lord named the first one himself. He said, call him Ishmael. Which means, God hears. And in spite of the name given to the child, he tells him he doesn't have any more than one son. And that son is Isaac, which means he laughs. And that's the one son. You hold him in your hand, and he breaks into the most heavenly smile. That's the sign. And all the signs of scripture are true, but they are not what the world called secular stories. They are not. They can look forever all through the Near East to try to find the tomb of this one and the tomb of the other one. And all the little things they think they are going to find, they will not find them. For this is not of this earth. This is entirely different to history. Secular history will vanish. And leave not a trace behind it. And divine history is forever and forever. And the very last one experiences the story of Jesus. 
And when the very last one, then the whole curtain comes down on the play. And we all want. We all form the one being, the one body, the one spirit, the one Lord, the one God and Father of all. And there is no other. So I'm not telling you that you should not aspire and try to be greater than you are today. No. Keep on making every effort to transcend your present state. Do it. It's all within the book. For you to do it. Dare to live in the end of your dream as though it were true. And it will become true. Just as Frost tells us, Robert Frost, our founding fathers did not believe in the future. They believed it in. They didn't believe in the future. That something is going to happen regardless of what I do. It will happen because of what I do. Everything in my world is like imaginal activities projected. And I will make a better world or a more horrible world, depending on my imagined activities. But that's in something entirely different from what's taking place in me, which is the story of Jesus unfolding. And it comes suddenly. It erupts without any warning whatsoever. But the things on the outside, if I know what I have imagined, I can tell what's going to happen in my world. I don't need the stars. The stars, they are Buddhist, as you're told in Shakespeare. It's not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Don't look to the stars to give you any direction as to what's going to happen to you, or to any teacup leaves, or monkey bones, or anything else. It's not there. It's all in your own wonderful human imagination. Tell me what you are imagining, and I'll prophesy for you. If you are faithful to that imaginal act, if you dare to assume that you are the man that you want to be, and remain faithful to that assumption, I can predict what you're going to be, if you remain faithful to it. And it's not based upon any star, or anything else outside of you. It's all within your own wonderful human imagination. But no matter what you accomplish in this world of Caesar, it will all vanish. It is what was predetermined before that the world was that interests me. And that's all written in scripture. In the signs and the wonders. And so his life, Jesus' life, you understand what it means, is a sign. His whole life is a sign, if you understand it. And that whole life is going to be in the individual without the change of identity of that individual. You don't change from Neville to Jesus, you're still Neville, but you are the Lord Jesus Christ. A friend of mine, when I was in San Francisco, in July, he's here tonight and he wrote me a letter. He said, I've had the most exciting vision that I have ever had. He said, in my vision, a woman said to me, Neville has risen. Then pointing down the corridor, he said, look, at the end of the corridor was this effulgence of light, golden pulsing living light. And I knew that you were my friend, the man Neville that I know. Yet I knew that you were the Lord. I knew that at your home, it is always an open door for me. I could come to your home any time of the day. And you would welcome me without an invitation. Yet at this moment, I felt this needs a special invitation. And so I hesitated to go. But I knew that if I went, went down that corridor and turned off into the area where the light came in this enormous profusion, I would enter into the Holy of Holies. Yet I knew that you were my friend. A man that I know in this world, and yet I knew you to be the Lord, the risen Lord. Now, he wrote me that letter, and I was there after my first week. I got it the second week that I was there. He said, it was my most exciting vision, but I knew I was not invited. But I also knew that you always said to me, I will appear to you, and I will show you who I am. 
I have told many of you that, and I will. I have appeared to many, because it has happened in me. It's not anything to brag about, but as Paul said in his letter, the 12th chapter of 2nd Corinthians, I must boast. There is nothing to gain from it. But I know a man in Christ who was lifted up 14 years ago into the third heaven. Now whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. But I do know a man in Christ who was lifted up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Now he tells us he saw and heard what cannot be uttered. It's stated in certain, I would say, translations that it's not lawful. It is, that it's not lawful. You can't find words to tell it. There's nothing unlawful about telling about experience, but how are you going to find the images to tell it? You saw and heard things that are not lawful to be spoken. It isn't, it's not lawful, but how on earth are you going to describe an age that has not a thing to do with this? You're lifted up into an entirely different state. And when people ask a question, they expect you to give an answer in terms of their current background of thought, but you can't do it. They expect to, uh, well, all right, you went to dinner tonight and you went to chastens maybe. They want a better chasten. It isn't chastened. They want something, a better transportation. It isn't there. It's something entirely different. And you can't find any images on earth to couch the experience. So Paul said it was not lawful for man to utter. They were unutterable utterances. Well, how are you going to do it? How will I explain to anyone actually what happened in me? I did it to the best of my ability, and I tried to tell it in my book, Resurrection. But did I succeed? I told it to the best of my ability. In my book called Resurrection, the last chapter bears the title of the book. But I can tell you if I succeeded or not. Because how am I going to find images here, not this here? to describe the experiences of Scripture when man experiences the story of Jesus. And he knows who he is. He knows who he is. But he doesn't change his identity. He only knows he is the Lord. He knows he is the father of David, as told us in Scripture. And I will tell of the decree of the Lord, said David. He said unto me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. And then David, in the 89th Psalm, the Lord now speaks, I have found David. And he has cried unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. So here we have confirmation of it. He finds, the Father calls him Son, and then the Father finds him, and he calls the Father, my Father. What well, I have experienced it, but how am I going to experience it? I tell it so that it can go over to a mind that has been so conditioned to be in a secular world. The Bible is not speaking of anything about this world. You can look forever and you aren't going to find any tomb where Jesus was buried, in spite of the churches. So they had the Holy Sepulchre, and some little thing built over it, and they call that the Holy Sepulchre. Then they find another place, they call that where David was buried. And these archaeologists and wise men have given years and years of study to their science. And they're all men of great degrees, but it's more than scholarship. It takes much more than scholarship to understand scripture. You have to experience scripture before you can begin to understand how altogether wonderful it is. And if you don't experience scripture, you can just go all around the bush and miss it. You can't find it, because it's not a secular story. The Bible is not of this world at all. It's an entirely different world. 
of a different being, and that being is in this world, clothed in a garment of flesh and blood. And that is only a garment, it is not the being that is clothed. The being that is clothed has a garment, but you can destroy this now. And that garment that he really wears cannot be touched by anything in this world. It can never be destroyed. We have a body that is immortal, that is imperishable, and it cannot be destroyed by anything known to man in this world. This body will die, yes, this will die. It could go tonight, as far as I'm concerned. If there's work for me to be done in this world to do, all right, I'll be here to do it. Because there's a time for everything. And so a time to be born, a time to die, a time to laugh, a time to cry. So I came in on time, and I'll go on time. I came in on cue, I'll go on cue. Whether it be a violent exit or a normal natural exit. From old age or what they call a heart attack. I don't care what they call it. They'll give it some kind of a name. Because in this world of Caesar, we have to have a name for everything. Because it's insured. You aren't going to pay the insurance unless you can just prove that it had some reason for going. But I say, I came on time. I'm going on time. I know doctor in the world will prolong my departure one hour. I have taught in scripture. Who by being anxious can add one hour to his span of life really carefully. It used to be thought that it meant one cubit, which would be say 30 inches, to his statue, like suddenly growing up 30 inches. No. The new translation, which is a far better translation of the Greek, who by being anxious can add one hour to his span of life. Can. If you take it the word cubit, or even that would be a step, how can I add one more step than that which is the allotted portion of my world. I can't. Well, I'll go on time. I came in on time. So all these little plots and plans for men will go awry. They will not work out because the whole thing is perfect. And everyone will one day experience the entire story of Jesus within himself. But he will be cast in the role of Jesus without change of identity. He is the Lord. So I tell you, you are the Lord, Jesus Christ. And there is no other Lord Jesus Christ. He is buried in you and he was not buried in any little thing in Jerusalem. He was buried on Golgotha. Golgotha is the Aramaic and Hebrew word for skull. Look translates the word as it should be translated, skull. They do not give the Aramaic word, and he was actually crucified on a place called the skull. And he was buried near, where he was crucified, and he was crucified on the skull. So that's where God is buried, buried in the skull of man. It is there that he's going to rise. He's going to rise in man. And when he rises in man, you are the Lord Jesus Christ. For in the end, there is only Jesus. There is nothing but Jesus. Now let us go into the silence.